let me start by saying that it's a big pleasure to be here. I knew to Spru, and I must admit that I, when I arrived this year, I'm impressed with the quality of my colleagues. Spru is a place to address big issues our society is facing. And therefore, I think it's also appropriate that Spru is developing a new big collaborative research program on transformative change the topic of this session. And the ambition of this program is, on the one hand, to develop fundamental new knowledge, and at the same time, to be practical. And I think I'm a firm believer in the combination of this. And we just announced that we are hiring three new professors in this area. So if you are interested, let us know. The title of my intervention is the second big transition or the struggle for inclusive capitalism. When we discuss long-term funding for innovation, mission-oriented funding, we must look into the future. And what do we see when we look into the future? I will argue four points. The first one is that the world is in transition to a new form of capitalism. And this is the second big transition. Secondly, we should draw lessons from the first big transition. This was the transition to industrial capitalism. Then I will go on to discuss some drivers for the change, and I will finalize with some implications for our discussion. Okay, the world is in transition. Capitalism has gone through long waves, but the transition I want to talk about goes beyond long wave dynamics. Because I believe we write a deeper crisis of modernity or capitalism. For me, I use these two words interchangeable. My suggestion is that we're not just surfing a new wave, but we are breaking the wave. I propose we are going through a second big transition or a great transformation. The first big transition was our move from commercial capitalism to industrial capitalism. Now, we are moving to a new form. The jury is still out what it will be, either a brutal form of capitalism or a more inclusive one. Brutal capitalism will generate economic growth. It will be driven by innovation. But the outcomes will be inequality, distrib uh, distribution of, in terms of distribution of wealth, in terms of access to opportunities, in terms of exposure to pollution, exposure to the effects of climate change, and so on. There's one aspect that's different from our world, is that the distribution between the North and South will be completely different. We will have some of the deeper inequalities within the West. Inequality will become transnational. Inclusive capitalism will also generate economic growth, driven by innovation, but a very different type of growth one that prevents the generation of huge inequalities. And in this type of capitalism, I believe we do not expect the state to be responsible for distribution and for preventing inequality. I think we have put a lot of emphasis on the state, and I would like to question that. I think we should be building on the creativity of people and civil society, who will be able to appropriate the rewards and in this way, restore the risk-reward nexus Mariana and others have been talking about. This suggests, all of this suggests, that there's a choice to be made. What is the world we want to live in? So, an important issue for mission-oriented finance is indeed directionality. The question, do we want a man on the moon? The question is, which mission do we want to embark on? And then, what type of finance is needed for this mission? Okay, let me go back into history. I mean, I'm an historian by training, and I want to emphasize that I'm not negative about the accomplishments of capitalism. Let's not forget, capitalism and modernity provided growth and the welfare state. It led, more importantly even, to democratization of mobility, both socially and geographically, but also politically. It implicated the rise of nation states, the making of citizens, and the inclusion of all people in a democratic system. This is historically a very radical, positive result. 
And most of all, capitalism rewarded innovation. The, and what is innovation? It's the introduction of novelty in the world. It is based on expectation for a better future and fulfilling the aspirations of people. In pre-modern times, novelty was not valued and innovation was constrained. Hopes for a better future were invested in religion, in waging wars, or in moving to a new place. This is for me the essence of capitalism, not capital accumulation, but the turning of innovation into the holy grail, the lever of riches, citing Joe Mokier, or the measure of man, citing Michael Eddes. But having said this, I also want to remind you of four basic facts related to innovation, which are important for to think about. One, war was a real important driving force for innovation, both hot and cold wars. You have to ask the questions, the question how wars will influence the future development of capitalism. In other words, do we want our mission-oriented finance to be driven by the military and security agenda? And what will this lead to? Secondly, capitalism was built on the exploitation of the South. And it's not the case that the South was not involved in building up of capitalism. Contrary to the conceived wisdom, England was not the birthplace of capitalism and the Industrial Revolution. What is true is that England was one of the main beneficiaries of the results. It appropriated the results. But the Industrial Revolution was also born in the South. This reminds me this reminds us to ask the question about appropriation and the mechanisms for appropriation of the benefits of the second big transition. Third, capitalism in the past, industrial capitalism, has been built around several innovation pathways. In other words, it involved technological choice. What kind of choices, for example, between collective solutions and private solutions, between flexible specialization, mass production and mass consumption, between labor productivity and prevention of waste and energy efficiency, and between various rates of mechanizations. And all these choices have been heavily, heavily debated in the past. In the West, the post-war outcome was a preference for private solutions, mass production, mass consum consumption, mechanization, and the boosting of labor productivity. And to make the state responsible for picking up all the negative distributional effect. So the funny thing is, on the one hand, we stimulate innovation, that's firms supposed to do, and on the other hand, we have the state that is picking up the bad effects and dealing with the distribu distribution. So we have a kind of two-track approach, completely separate. This is the institutional setup, and the question is, for the future, if we should start combining these two much better, and then if the state should be in the lead. Let me also add a fourth point that the, the process of making choices was not an easy and smooth process. It involved conflict between many forces in society and many people, between labor and capital, between various ideologies, fascism, communism, and liberal democracy. Think about the 20th century. It was a bloody affair. Between classes, between political parties. But throughout the period, citizens and social movements were an important force. And I've not heard at this conference enough the word civil society. In the post-war period, it led to a new deal, a specific compromise which shaped the post-war order. I think for the 21st century, we should expect similar conflicts in the defining the process of a new mission for capitalism. And we should anticipate these conflicts. We should work with them. We should talk about them. We should also expect that companies, unions, and government will defend the old new deal. And their stranded assets, as Tom Heller reminded us yesterday, will, be, will prevent them largely to be very proactive. The question then is, how will we manage conflicts in the second big transition? How will the new deal look like in the future? Well, now I come to the drivers for the second big transition. We are living today, because I believe it's happening. First, we see a new wave of consumers entering the market. 
I'm talking about several billion of consumers, not in the north, but in the south. They are still poor, but yet they have aspirations. They want to participate in a modern life. They cannot afford the expensive Western products. Therefore, they are developing or rediscovering consumer habits of the past. Of they are discovering, you know, sharing, tinkering, remaking, recycling. The need of these consumers require new type of services, products, distribution channels, business models and visions. We cannot pretend or assume that they will become like us or that they will accept run-down versions of our consumer habits. They will translate their aspirations into complete new forms of production and consumption. The second driver is that we cannot afford to diffuse our, our lifestyles, our current systems of mobility provision, food provision, healthcare provision, water provision, energy provision on a global scale. It is not sustainable. This will hit the climate change wall rather sooner than later. This will bring social turmoil, volatile prices for energy, food, mobility, water, and even healthcare. It will become clear that business as usual does not work anymore. So the question is, what is the solution? And then the question is, if investment in new pharmaceutical products is the solution, so R&D on new pharmaceutical products, or if we should think about ways to transform the healthcare system. I think we should do the latter. And then it also means that in the West, while we're searching for new solutions, we might want to learn from the new solutions pioneered in what we used to call the South. Their solution will come to us. Thirdly, an extra driver is that in our societies, the lower and middle class is squeezed and their incomes are stagnant. <coughs> their wages do not allow them anymore to fulfill their aspirations in the old way, through mass production and mass consumption. So there is an emerging set of consumers, also in the West, that starting to ask questions how they will fulfill their aspirations and what they really need. This will also be an important force. So I've been talking a lot about consumers, not about supply. On top of that, we have a growing group of wealthy consumers in the West who are becoming more aware of climate change issues and who are willing to experiment with new forms of consumerism. They will be mobilized through social movements, experimenting with what we call grassroots innovations, a new wave of innovations to reduce waste and increase the efficiency with which we will use resources. It's happening and it's becoming stronger. Okay, what are the implications for mission-oriented finance and innovation? First, we need to situate our discussion into this larger context. And then we have to ask the question, what is our mission? If we want to do mission-oriented innovation, what is the mission? This discussion should be a lot more central. Secondly, we cannot expect a new mission to be formulated by governments and industry in a coalition in the Western world. It's a global affair and it's transnational. We often tend to emphasize the national level. I think we should emphasize a lot more the transnational level. Third, the, the mission needs to involve direct interaction with civil society and users, including the poor. Fourth, when we talk innovation, we should not only focus on high tech and the laboratory, what we call R&D. We should also look at what we used to call low-tech. Concretely, we should not only focus on building new electrical connected cars, we might also want to look at smart biking, new forms of car sharing and mobility provision. Finally, the discussion about finance should include a discussion about microcredits and other forms of collective funding such as crowdfunding, family funding and various forms of collective consumer investments. Spru will continue this important agenda over the coming years, and I hope you will join us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan.
So basically, from, from what it sounds like, um, it's 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 a it's an inflection point between Star Wars or Star Trek. Um, so Paul, why don't you um, present some of your views, and then we'll enter into de into a debate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for this. Um, so I'm a I'm an economics journalist, and um, one of the um, joys of doing that is that you're not peer reviewed, except um, except by people who shout obscenities at you in real time when they think you've done something bad uh, in your newsroom. It's a good form of peer review, but in the sense that it, what it allows us to do is to think a little bit more laterally and to um, propose things that are that may have more uh, in common with Star Trek than Star Wars. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about work I've been doing on a book that comes out next year called Post-Capitalism, whose title which, uh, obviously reflects the, uh, the title of a, of a 1990 uh, book by uh, Peter Drucker. Uh, and I think Drucker is well worth going back to. Of course, Drucker, the last surviving Schumpeterian of that age. Um, when we think about what the impact of non-market forms is going to be on what we're talking about at this conference, which is the relationship between the state and market economies. So, since the Lehman Brothers crisis, since the since the global financial crisis um, broke out, I I came pretty quickly to the conclusion that what had happened was the end of a 50-year cycle. Um, but in going back and trying to reread a lot of stuff on 50-year cycles, obviously Carl Otter's stuff. Obviously, the, all the Schumpeterian work that's been done on long cycles. I came to the conclusion that Kondratiev himself was more right than any of the people who followed him. Um, and what I describe, what what, I, what I'm trying to do is to describe the 1945 to 2008 and 8 period as what I call a long, a prolonged, disrupted wave. And I want to just explain what what I think the relevance of that is to where we go in the future. OK, so Kondratiev says that waves begin with the deployment of technology. So Carlotta's, Carlotta's theory and those who agree with her say it tends to emphasize the invention process. Kondratiev says the deployment moment. So he says it's, it's the Industrial Revolution. It's the post-1848 upsurge of capitalism. It's the second Industrial Revolution of the, of the, of the 1900s and 1910s, and a Kondratievist reading of that would then say the 1940s begin the fourth wave. That's where I come from on this. The next thing is that Kondratiev really clear that tech is an effect of the wave. It's not the cause. He says technology up revolutions, the wars and revolutions that accompany the rising wave, and the search for new sources of money in the form of gold in the two gold rushes that, that, he, that he pins on the beginning of the waves he describes are all effects. The cause is economic. And I think a, a, a fruitful area of research, if one buys the idea of long cycles, is to look for, for what is the cause of, what is the economic cause of the rise and fall of, of you might, what you might call paradigms of accumulation. Um, I think if we do that, there is a fruitful um, explanation uh, the, of the last 50 or 60 years that can be constructed that takes us forward. So, so what do I think it is? I think, obviously, Kondratiev himself had a very primitive view of what the economic engine was that was driving these 50-year pulses. He took, basically from Marx, um, the idea that it was the... the the, the exhaustion, the deployment and exhaustion of large capital projects, so canals, railways, um, steelworks, etc. Um, I think that's not sustainable. I think if, we, if instead we don't look for a general sort of inner abstract law, but begin to look for a more concrete thing, the, an, the answer is there in business theory. The answer is there in, in, in many iterations of, of business theory. It is the exhaustion, exhaustion of specific business models and paradigms which are effectively collections of business models. Um, <clears throat> we, I think it's entirely possible to, to describe the 200-year history of industrial capitalism as a series of 50-year spurts in which a combination of business mod new business model, new combination of business model, new series of class relations, new sources of money in the form of gold rushes in the first two iterations, um, and realignments of the world, so conquest, reconquest. Th this, is, this is 
a describable reality. No, what I think's been missing from some of the Schumpeterian writing about this is, is, a, is a, a more complex understanding of the role of class in those evolutions. The, 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 it, it's not, I don't think it's, I don't think, with, with Carlotta Perez's work, it's not, it's not caricaturing it to say that she, 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 can, she, can, she creates a sort of list of people who oppose the change when it comes and people who are, who are advocates of it. And, and working class people can fall into both categories, and they do, as can um, business people. But if you look at the way these 50-year iterations have happened from a point of view of social history, I think there is a moment that has been slightly under-emphasised. And it is this. To me, what happens, and you could apply this to, you take, take any 50-year period in capitalism and apply this to it. I'll describe it in the abstract. It's going fine till the middle, till the 25-year hiatus, and then you hit the crisis period. And what generally tends to happen is that business leaders and thinkers and statespeople will try and impose a solution on the basis of the old system that worked. And one part of that solution that's really important is to drive down wages and to automate hitherto skilled te technology sectors. And the one Marx talks about, which I know for some of the people in this room has become like a cause celebra, um, is the self-acting the, the self mule, the, the automated cotton spinning mule, uh, which simply removed the need for a bloke to push the things, the 168 spindles backwards and forwards on a track. That was, everything else was automated. They just needed arm power, which apparently was the same as lifting a quite heavy dumbbell. Once they'd done that, Marx and Engels and their chartist interlocutors in 1840s Manchester and, and later London were thought that, that skilled work was doomed. There wouldn't be a skilled working class. Of course, this was rubbish, and that the skilled workers of Manchester and Lancashire were able to survive this and reimpose skill in the second wave of capitalism so that they become a, a, an almost elite class of people who don't push and pull, simply watch the machine. Meanwhile, around them grow up printers, iron molders, uh, barrel makers, all kinds of second cycle, second wave of, ca of, of industrial capitalism, um, skilled workers. And again, in the 1880s, you see the, the hammering down on trade unions, resistance. Resistance prevents simple reduction of wages and the simple automa automation of skilled tasks. And workers force, I would argue, um, a new set of capitalists to rethink the problems of mid-19th century capitalism in the form that we know all too well from Hilferding and, yeah, and, and the rest of monopoly. So, so the, the monopolies that are arising around US Steel, um, are around um, AT&T in, in the 1900s, uh, and the, the technology on which they are based, are quite clearly the organizational and technological solution to a problem that was there in the mid-19th century that was not solvable by bearing down on wages. Then you get, obviously, the mid-20th century, uh, uh, we'll uh, cut to the chase. Um, I think after the war, we have had a classic cycle, a classic upswing for 25 years, the, the long boom, the, tr the trong ane glorias, etc., at which capital in the West, at the crisis point, decides to try and solve the problem by bearing down on wages and worker self-organization, and for the first time, they succeed. By succeeding in the West, America, Britain, Germany later, by succeeding in not only suppressing the wage push potential, the wage, you know, wage bargaining power potential of the, of, the, of the working class, but in large part exporting it to the global south, they, they, rem they almost remove the necessity for them to innovate because they have solved the problem to their own uh, liking for the last 25 years by creating a global south workforce and by immiserating their own workforce, and as we know, combining that with large amounts of cheap credit and, I would argue, the other crucial new thing, fiat money. So if you, if you have a defeated workforce for the first time in 200 years, the cycle is solved at first attempt by simply exporting the workforce and suppressing their wages, and then you have unlimited supplies of money, you don't need a Yukon gold rush. You can extend the wave for quite a long time. Now, what does that mean for understanding the crisis we're in. I, I think I, put, I agree with everything you just said. So in a way, this is not going to be um, a massive argument. 
But what I would argue, what I would say is that in this discussion, that there tends to be conferences like this around the state and markets, and then there t tends to be another discussion going on about the information economy uh, elsewhere. I think the two things could be fruitfully fused. What do I mean by failure to innovate? I think that w in, uh, in addition to the, to, to the inequality crisis we described, in addition to the um, <coughs> severe dis coming fragmentation and dislocation of the global economy, we are in a crisis of failure to innovate. Productivity in the West is not respond, it, it does not, you know, it does not respond to the level of tech innovation that has happened. In addition, wages are starting to get decoupled from the experience of work. Long before we get to the policy solution of the you know, universal basic income, which we could talk about, wages are becoming decoupled from time. For many skilled workers, what they are paid for is to exist, to have skills, to take the mobile phone out of their pocket at midnight and do work, and of course, to do non-work while they are at work, because that non-work is fueling a several tens of billions of dollars per year e-economy. I'm buying my holiday, I'm buying my e-books while I'm at work. So, where does it go? <coughs> That famous Hermit, Herbert Simon paper where he says, if the Martians came to Earth, um, they would, they would, and they looked at it, they would see what? Do you, do you remember what he says? They would see thin red lines which represent market relations, big green blobs which represent organizations, and blue diagrams that represent hierarchy diagrams within firms. That's Herbert Simon's great what, metaphor for that reminds us not to talk only about markets, that the modern economy is all three things. I think if Martians came today, they'd go, wow, there's another color. There is, in addition to organization, in addition to markets, in addition to hierarchies, there are non-market non relations. Why? Because information, which is going to be the key material of the, of the, of the upswing of the fifth phase, whether we call it capitalism or not, information tends to dissolve price mechanisms. Roma 1990, I think, is an amazingly, un the, the Im impacts of Paul Roma's work on what is information and what does it do to market relations have hardly been explored. With, I'll, I'll give you two examples. What does it do? We know what information, how, how information works when it is a commodity. It, it basically dissolves market relations. Its cost of production or reproduction tends towards zero. You tend to always have curves that go towards the near zero for the reproduction of already created information. Large parts of the physical world are now alive with information. A, an airliner can't fly without information. The, the strut of, its, of it, the fan blade that, blade that drives the engine could not exist because it's a, atomically impossible to produce without a computer. So the information isn't just the information, it is what's gone into things. And I think that we, in, we should first of all explore this problem that of, of, of the non-marketization of information. What has the solution been, the interim solution, is to be to create monopolies on a scale that AT&T and US Steel could not have dreamed of. Information monopolies have to be absolute. There can only be one Google, one Facebook. There's not a big four in any of these sectors, there's a big one. And I think that it's oh, big two in the case of, of smartphones. The reason there is because monopoly, as Roma pointed out 25 years ago, is, on, is the only response to the tendency of information to price to, to approach zero. You have to, in order to, to, to commercialize it, to monetize it, create defensible monopolies around it. So we're in a situation where we've got these monopolies. They tend to last about five or 10 years. You know, Microsoft, Nokia once had, you know, near monopoly status in handsets, now iPhone did, now Samsung has it. These monopolies are not lasting very long. The second thing is, on top of the, this, this problem of, of, of what, what information is doing to the market world, is that, as Yokai Benkler, the, the Harvard Law professor, has pointed out, there is springing up alongside the market world a non-market form of economic activity. I think that's what the Martians would see, the new color, as they look from, from space. This form of non-market activity is totally misunderstood at every level of economics. So you go to the accountants and you say, well, what, how do you value 
the blueprint, the, the, the actual um, data set that creates a 747. Okay? What is Boeing, how, much, wh how is that measured on Boeing's books? What is the value of the tool that creates it? Dassault, Dassault Systems owns this tool, um, Katia, on which all these airplanes are virtually built. What is the value of that? Well, if you look at Dassault Systems books, it says the value is kind of roughly, we can't, we roughly, a few, a few, it doesn't really answer. But then it does say one thing, the biggest risk to our business is that somebody works out to how to make one of these for free, because it isn't that clever a tool. So, the non-market economy is rising. The non-market economy is peer-to-peer. -peer. It is eating into, you know, so 95% of all online music sales are, I are iTunes, great for Apple. Does that mean the other 5% of the market represents the whole of musical activity of humanity digitally? Absolutely not. It simply is not being captured by any monopolizable form of market. So what's the what should we do? What should we do, I think, is this. If I was to say what mission-oriented finance or what a mini the ministry of, uh, of business of a big country should do, because we know from all the other iterations that what has to happen is the state has to rethink what the different bits of the economy are and how they fit together. The state always does this. It does it in 1900, it does it in 1848, it does it after World War II. The rethink of the state should just as much as it involves becoming, as Mariana calls it, entrepreneurial with regard to market economies, it has to be an enabler to non-market economies. So I would set up an office of peer-to-peer. -peer. An office of peer-to-peer -peer is only useful if you understand where peer-to-peer -peer economic activity comes from, where the 26,000 people who write Wikipedia for free uh, get their time. They get it by doing jobs where they arbitrage work and non-work, wages and non-wages. So once you've got an office for peer-to-peer, -peer, you probably pretty quickly have to have some kind of office or project for delinking work from wages. And I think those two things, small as they might be, would be incredibly powerful for ministries or governments or large corporations in trying to rethink what the future, whether it's, we call it capitalism or not, is. Because to leave with a quote from Weber, w which I think, which I've got from, from Drucker, he, he mentioned, he says, in the first industrial revolution, it wasn't a, the case, it wasn't technology, and it wasn't even th a new business model. I think, I could, from memory, the quote goes something like this. All it took was the sons, sons of a few rich men to start thinking differently about what they did with money for the new spirit of capitalism to be born. That's his describing Richard Artwright and, and, and James Watt. All it would take for us, and it's already happening, is for a new spirit of capitalism or post-capitalism to be born is for states, businesses, organizations, and economists to start thinking about information as real material but non-market economic good. That's it.